This is a Talk Station original podcast. This is Christine Brin, and on this week's episode on Salty History, we will be talking with Michelle Cropeau from the North Carolina Maritime Museum about women and piracy. We will be looking at three examples from the 15 to 1800s. We will touch on the politics, culture, and general motivating factors behind these women turning to this criminal lifestyle. It all starts right now on Salty History. My name is Christine Brin, and I'm an Associate Curator of Education at the North Carolina Maritime Museum in Beaufort, and today I have with me Michelle Crepeau. Hi, my name is Michelle Crepeau, and I am the Curator of Museum Conservation, aka the Museum Conservator at the North Carolina Maritime Museum. I have been with the museum for about 14 years, and a woman since I hit puberty somewhere in the 90s. And Michelle has been with the museum for about six years, with an equally long career as a woman. As a result, I think we've both taken a special interest in discussions of women in maritime history, specifically that of women actively participating as pirates in the 16 and 1700s. Would you say I'm correct, Michelle? Yeah, I think so. I think, you know, correct with the 90s. Yeah, I think in the 90s, in particular, growing up with the (laughs) various movies and other types of media that kind of well, you talk to millenn- well the uh, younger generation today. We grew up in the late 1900s. Yes, that is, makes us feel ancient. That is something to think about. Yeah. <laughs> yes, it's it's a true statement, but I don't like it. I, I don't like it. Well, today we're talking about women from the late 16th and 1700s that grew up and chose a different lifestyle than you and I chose. We chose to go into the education field or into the museum field. They chose a very different lifestyle. They went into the world of piracy. So. My first question is, if you were born in that time period, do you think you could be a female pirate? Oh, good question. I don't. I like. I like to say like I'm too risk averse. I'm too cautious of a person to probably go into such a high risk field with such a high mortality rate. But then again, I, you know, I, I don't know. It kind of depends on. I, I know I'm saying this as a modern person who comes from a culture and a time period where. I'm kind of allowed to be risk averse, and it's a lot easier. But mm-hmm. you know, growing up in the 1500s, 1600s, 1700s, 1800s, yeah, there may have been a lot of other life circumstances in which I might have even accidentally found myself having to contemplate the option of going to sea, piracy or not. So yeah, I mean, it does come down to options. Like mm-hmm. if I had the option between working in a museum versus being a pirate, I probably still would choose the museum. I mean, I don't I like stinky things, and I, from what I understand, museum pirate ships are pretty stinky. I also have a tendency towards motion sickness so I'd, I'd mm. take adjustment I think to you know I've always lived by the ocean but I th- and I like being on boats but I think it would take an adjustment to being on boat for most of my you know year essentially. yeah essentially but and it comes yeah, I guess it's like sanitary conditions not really good food what I find interesting though is the fact that disease, both of our concerns about being pirates has nothing to do with the 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 stealing the being in the illegal lifestyle it's more about the morality of it it. we're both very comfortable with the idea of going out and being thieves um it's the idea of the cleanliness and the practicalities the practicalities of it but we did you did touch a little bit on a on a point that we want to kind of explore a little more today and that is the idea of options obviously we have better options than turning to a lifestyle of piracy in the 15, 16, 1700s, not the case for a lot of women. The different options they had as far as was really getting married, living that more traditional lifestyle. But if that wasn't an option for them, for some reason they found themselves pregnant out of wedlock or in a circumstance that just made those more traditional right. options not an option. If your support system died or you got it, separated from them somehow. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. Or you got dishonored somehow you had to find different routes and piracy may have looked like a very appealing route i wanted today to kind of focus on three examples that i think we're both very familiar with of women we know were pirates during the golden what is known as the well actually i say golden age of piracy but a couple of them are from kind of predate it so we're going to look I mean, at... Women have been pirates for as long as piracy has been around. Yeah, so. and piracy has been around as long as people have been at sea. Exactly. So. Now, I do want to go with the caveat that while we do know the names of some of the women at, 
female pirates. There's so many female pirates that we simply don't know. Yeah, I think much like uh, female serial killers. <laughs> yeah, I get that's true. They're they're good at their jobs, we'll just say. So yeah, a successful they're... woman criminal is often the ones you don't hear about because mm-hmm. you don't hear about them. Yeah, because they got away with it. And one thing that we see with female pirates is the fact that they faced the same risk that their male counterparts would, but they would have had additional risks, Mm. sexual violence being something of a concern. So it made it necessary often for them to conceal their gender. And the ones that were most successful at that, unfortunately, have gotten lost to history because they've gone down in history as just another male pirate. But like I said, today we are going to talk about three female pirates that we do know were women, and history has actually given us their names and a lot of their story. We have Grace O'Malley, Anne Bonnie and Ching Shi, also known as Chung Yiso. Yes, thank you. I have not been able to quite successfully wrap my mouth around that. She has two alternative names throughout and her novel. Neither of them are really her names either. They're both sort of titles. Like Chung Yiso oh, that- just means wife of Chung Yi. So. That's right. I forgot. I did read that. So like, you know, what she was actually called as an individual person. I'm not even sure if we, anyone, we have that documented anywhere. I think I did read about that, and they said they didn't have it anywhere what her real name was. Um, And that was not uncommon, unfortunately, Um, which also reflects those limited opportunities. The interesting thing about these three ladies is that they kind of come from three different motivating factors that Mm -hmm. would have led them to piracy. When we think about a motivating factor that would lead to somebody to piracy, you just assume it's going to be wealth. It's going to be treasure, right? That's what movies tell us. Uh, ambition we'll say (laughs) ambition and in the case of these three ladies we see political motivating factors we see necessity um one comes from the sex trade right and then we also see eh, to some extent they did stay in the field because they were successful at it well i think piracy is means motive and opportunity as many Mm -hmm. things are yes um and also i think you know it also depends like what is piracy and who gets to define who's a pirate a lot of these women in their own time periods were considered you know folk heroes and freedom fighters um as well as being scourges of the seas i think a lot of it depends on who gets to tell the story and Mm. um i think some of the really the juicy ones tend to be from the women that get got to tell their own stories yes definitely Um, And that touches on um, the first one we were going to talk about, which was Grace O'Malley. Yes. Grace O'Malley has one of the juicier. I mean, all three of these have very um, colorful stories. Um, Grace O'Malley was born around 1530, um, would ultimately die in 1603. Um, You're a lot more familiar with her story. So if you want to share that real quick. Yes. um, So Grace O'Malley, also known as Gran O'Malley in in Gaelic, um, was basically born into Irish nobility. She was the daughter of one of the clan chieftains of the clan O'Malley um, and grew up in a castle by the sea on an island, actually, and from a very mm-hmm. young age was very um, interested in her father's um, sort of business at sea. Like, he himself was a very well-known navigator and sailor, um, and she very much applied him herself to that trade. Like, she was in a situation, I think, as the chieftain's daughter where she had a certain amount of leeway to do what she wants during this time period. Um, I think class was probably a bigger indicator of what you got to do in life than Mm -hmm. gender necessarily. So even though she was a woman, she was still the daughter of a chieftain and still, you know, nobility essentially. So there was a certain expectation that she'd take on, at least kind of in sort of a circumspect way, a lot of the duties of her male counterpart just by virtue of, you know, expecting to marry into a position of authority at the very least. Mm -hmm. Um, And have sort of her own volition kind of um, was wanted to learn the seafaring craft and did so from her father. Like, you know, uh, there's this one funny story about her like cutting off her hair and disguising herself as a boy so that she could kind of stow away on one of her father's voyages. And um, they just kind of rolled with it apparently. They just let it go. Yeah. Yeah, and um, They're like, oh, that's great. But, you know, at the same time, when she was 16 16 years old, she was married for the first time to a person named Donald Flaherty, Mm -hmm. um, who was a very warlike person. Like, they seemed to get along well enough. They had several children together, um, but he was very much more of a warrior than a statesman or administrator. So while he was away um, attacking other castles, trying to get land, etc., she was sort of left to take on a lot of the administrative duties, which was not necessarily expected of her, but she thrived at it. She was very, very good at it, to the point where she basically uh, really amassed her own sort of following within her husband's clan, like mm-hmm. not her, you know, her, basically the clan to which she was transported to, or transplanted. And this is the Fitzgerald clan? Yes, this, um, the O'Flaherty, sorry, the O'Flaherty, O'Flaherty. clan. Okay. Um, um, and then when her, and she 
she rocked it. I mean, she was like a really popular, well-respected leader at this time mm-hmm. period. Unfortunately, when her husband did eventually die in battle, she was sort As of- warriors do. Yes. She was usurped by another male relative of his. So she sort of essentially was told that you did a great job, sweetheart, but you're because you're a woman, you're not actually able to take on the actual mantle of chieftain. And to what she was basically like, screw that, basically took all her loyal followers and went back home, essentially, and amassed more people. And at this point, being a widow with some- power and backing and a skill set decided the I have to say hmm. the key there is the fact that she had the skill set and experience she had skill set and experience the and education. also um, the manpower and the resource to be able to do this but this was also Ireland in the early Tudor period so you know the 1500s and this was very shortly after Henry the eighth had kind of really clamped down on English rule in Ireland Ireland and England had been at war for centuries but this is really kind of the first time that there really was a, a much more prevalent English presence there, English rule, English Mm -hmm. law, and things like that. And so at some point in this, she decides that what she's going to do is she's going to take this army of men, use her skill set, go to sea, and essentially turn pirate and start essentially attacking English merchant ships and others, but you know, especially the English. You know, she was very in the much name of in the name of you know her country of, yeah. of Ireland, essentially of air, and she was very successful of it because one thing she did know is that you know she grew up doing this, so she was very very familiar with the geography of the landscape, mm-hmm. um, and she was able to very successfully attack ships and then essentially disappear into the coastline of Ireland because she was much more well versed and where you know the caves were, inlets, places to hide, places to escape quickly. Mm-hmm. So she was very very successful. At some point, she did marry again to a man named Richard Burke. Um, And it's a very interesting story. They seem to have a very convivial relationship. During this time period, there was still a a facet of Irish law that was still commonly practiced called one year certain, where essentially you could marry someone, live with them for an entire year. And then at the end of the year, if you decide you didn't really like them, you could basically just amicably divorce, essentially. (laughs) And people just kind of go their separate way and they pretend it never happened. So she married Richard Burke for essentially resources when it came down to it, even though they seemed to have a good relationship. They even had a son together named Tibbet, who will actually come into factor her motivations later on in the story. But what happened is that a funny story is that he essentially went away on an errand after one year of marriage, came back, and eventually from the, the bolster out of their castle, she basically dismissed him. And he just kind of shrugged and turned around, apparently, um, and just sort of accepted that their marriage was over. Um, funnily enough, they remained um, both friends and political allies for pretty much the rest of his life. Oh, that is fascinating. So based on that story, we've already seen that you've touched on one of the first motivations that we are going to allude to as to what might have driven a woman to becoming a pirate, and that's politics. So Something that also could have driven a man too. Well, yes. commonly did, but she Grace, was driven very much by very politics. much so, and in fact, so much that she became sort of this emblem of sort of Irish freedom fighting during this period. That she made herself some very powerful en- enemies. She had a, a nemesis, even a man named Richard Bingham, who was essentially the, I, I guess, the 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 regent or the governor, or essentially the ruler of Ireland on behalf of England at this time, who imprisoned her several times. Mm-hmm. Um, one of which she was let go in order to appease Richard Burke, who was threatening rebellion if he didn't let her go. She was also famously rescued by another chieftain before they could execute her. Um, And so this kind of went on for several years. And Mm -hmm. eventually, though, he did get to her. So in the 1590s, somehow or other, Richard Bingham managed to get his hands on two of her children, one by her first husband, one is Tibbet, her second son, with her second husband. Um, And unfortunately, Owen O'Flaherty, her her son, perishes in prison. Mm -hmm. And Richard Bingham is essentially threatening to execute her second son, Tibbet, for treason. And what does Grace O'Malley do? She's in a hard spot. Like, basically, Mm -hmm. it's surrender, we kill your children, essentially. But Grace O'Malley is a a canny woman. And she decides that she's going to appeal to a higher power than Richard Bingham. She's going to basically appeal directly to the monarch of the English, which at this time was Queen Elizabeth I, another lady monarch. Um, So she wanted to talk to this woman, you know, mother, like lady to lady, not mother to mother, but woman to woman, queen to queen, essentially. Yeah. Um, So she sends her her a letter, presumably in English. Basically explaining the situation. And Elizabeth is intrigued by this. Mm. She's like, who is this woman? And sends her back a series of 18 questions, which Grace O'Malley very carefully plans her answers to, and then actually decides to go present them in person. So in 1593, she actually sets sail from Ireland and goes to England. Now I'm going to pause you there. Is there any documentation of these questions? Like, do we know what she asked? I'm not sure. Like, oh, I mean, I not, not in the sources I've read. I would love to know this I so would much. Be. Like, I'd what exactly s- her questions were. And what the answers were. <laughs> But yeah, Grace O'Malley essentially um, sneaks out of Ireland, sails across 
the sea essentially, and then ends up on the English shoreline and somehow makes her way to Queen Elizabeth in person and is granted an audience with her. Nice. And these two people have a conversation, which I would love to be a fly in the wall for oh, to see what they talked about. Yes. Um, and Queen Elizabeth was just so essentially impressed by this woman. And essentially, Grace O'Malley's offer is essentially, if you let my son go, I promise to pirate for you. Like, I will be your scourge upon the seas, and I will attack your enemies, and I will answer to no one but you. Ooh, her own personal yeah, queen so her, of the seas. sort of her own offer, essentially, her own personal lady pirate. And Elizabeth accepts. Well, she'd be a fool not to, knowing the kind of power that Grace was wielding. So Grace returns to Ireland. Her son is let go. Richard Bingham is eventually recalled in disgrace back to England. So she, she wins that one, we'll say. Mm-hmm. And then for as long as, as much as we know, she goes on to essentially continue her life of piracy, but essentially attacking the enemies of the British Isles, essentially. Just not of, Ireland. I meant she didn't turn Irish. against her no, own. I, I doubt she, she actually attacked her own people. But um, the but other yeah. enemies of Bryn. Yeah, and he, she... Lived a good long life, it sounds like. So. Yeah. Now, I she w- actually died in 1603, which is the same year that Queen Elizabeth died. So um, it's interesting that these two incredibly powerful women of their day, whose names still resonate through history, their lives are just so intricately connect- connected. I bet you there's some conspiracy theory out there that says they were the same woman and di- like oh, Queen I'm Elizabeth. But sure, somewhere. I, I would read that book. I'm <laughs> there's got to be. So if there is a fictional author out there, uh, there's your topic. You can have it. Yeah, free, um, free premise for you. <laughs> <laughs> Now, I will give the caveat that the three that I have chosen to talk about are three that actually did ultimately get to, in, according to some historians, retire from piracy. Yeah. And Ultimate that success story. Yeah, a lot of them are success stories to some extent. And that is not always the case, yeah. largely not the case with pirates. And so I do want to put the caveat out there that the three that I chose were um, by pure circumstance, I picked the three that had probably the most successful stories. And but again, I mean, they lived long enough that they were sort of able to kind of write create their, their own le- write their own legend, yeah, and make so. the legacy. So, uh, and that's the case. So the next one we wanted to talk about was Anne Bonny, yes. who was out of also out of Ireland, out of Cork, Ireland. Anne Bonny was probably born around sixteen ninety seven ish, and might have lived as long as about seventeen twenty one. There's some debate over yeah. when she died, which is interesting. So Anne Bonny, she had a different motivating factor hers wasn't politics so much as a run from traditional lifestyle when she was she was brought up in in, south carolina wasn't she in in south carolina so she actually has a connection to the carolina coast which is great charleston she was born in ireland and immigrated shortly after she was uh, born with her father Um, her mother did die while she was still very young Um, we're not sure if she died before or after they came to the but her father was a person of means, wasn't he? He was a plantation owner or something, mm-hmm. wasn't he? Yeah, he started off in Ireland. He was a lawyer. And then he got disgraced after having an affair that resulted in Anne herself. And then moved to Charleston and became a plant- yeah, merchant and a very successful merchant. And so she ended up having a very well, a relatively wealthy upbringing. And he tried to secure for her a more traditional husband and lifestyle. And she wanted none of that, according to the history books. And she instead married a penniless mariner and turned to the sea, which thrilled her father immensely. <laughs> and he disowned her at that point. And it's supposed to be that she then went off to sea, unhappy with that first marriage, didn't officially, I think, ever end it. Just no. kind of stopped. Well, didn't he become like a pirate hunter? He did like become, that? yeah. Like he knew Providence, and she was like, I'm much more interested in the pirates than mm-hmm. being a pirate hunter. So she meets this pirate, Calico Jack. Jack Rackham. Jack Rackham. He ends up being associated with Anne Bonny and Mary Reed, so two female pirates. but uh, Most well known for the ladies in his life. Yes, very much. And, he, uh, sa- and she sails with him for the majority of her career and before being captured later on. And um, they say that she had she was an extremely successful pirate and that she was known for being like the most profane and the most aggressive and one of the more violent. It's kind of ruthless. Yeah. Kind of ruthless. Really so embrace that lifestyle. Her motivation be- behind becoming a pirate had a lot more to do with avoiding that traditional lifestyle of not necessarily wanting to be the good wife that was staying at home. And when we look at Anne Bonny's story... It actually includes a bio on her mother as well, Mary Brennan. Some sources call her Peggy, some call her Mary, but Mary Brennan. I think I've seen it as Peggy most often, but Mary Brennan was her actual name. Probably. Well, that's the one given in General History of Pirates by Captain Charles well, Johnson. Probably, I mean, her name is probably Margaret, and she probably went by Mary and yeah. Peggy. Probably. And 
unfortunately with history being the way it is, yeah. game of telephone. But her mother came had also difficult circumstances and limited options. Mm-hmm. Her mother was a lady in the in Anne's father's household. She was the um, mate. She was the a maid. maid servant essentially. Mm-hmm. So. And ultimately, there was an affair going on while he was still married to his first wife, and she ends up getting dishonored in a lot of ways because she's found there it, it's this whole question about her possibly stealing and then the first the wife finds out that the affair is going on so she has her arrested it's really a great story if anybody ever wants to see in detail the story i do give it as a presentation at the museum i'm trying not to go into too much detail and be here for the next three hours talking about it she finds herself the mother does disgraced pregnant having been accused of thievery very limited options and but Anne's father, to his credit, like stays with her, though. Does stay with her. So she does end up having that safety net, which is great. Not every woman would have had that. Now, how much of a safety net that truly was, because who knows how nice of a guy he might have been in the beginning. Like, if you think about it, when she was a maid in the household, even if she didn't want to have an affair with him, she didn't really have any options to turn him down. No, I mean, it's your employer. He has, like, all the say in terms of whether you get to eat or have a house to sleep in yeah or like be turned away with references or yeah a lot of a lot of control over your life so Mm -hmm. so when we want to blame her for her choices like oh you were living this free and loose lifestyle and having an affair with the master of your house like that might not have been a choice for her right she had to do what she had to do to survive fortunately for her it seems to have worked out to some extent in that he continued to support her right despite her disgraced period there and he obviously recognized their child and supported her so Mm -hmm. yes and uh interestingly early on they tried to conceal the fact that the child was still living with him the um, bastard child and they would take Anne and dress her as a boy and portray her as his nephew um, present her as his nephew. Oh, right, because uh, wasn't he passing her off as like his le- his, like, legal assistant or something that he was yeah, training some, to be a lawyer? Yeah, so. that way he would kind of escape the scandal of having an affair and being separated from his wife and all that. The he truth came... the power of being perceived as male pretty early. Mm-hmm, yes, the power of that. And the and ultimately throughout her life, she would continue to read. Well, Mary Reed would also have a similar upbringing. Right. But Anne Bonny would start off her life in this very untraditional style of being portrayed as a little boy. She would have heard stories from her mom about that early life and the the choices that she made. And I wonder if this would have influenced her desire to not get married in a traditional manner, not grow up in that traditional lifestyle, not continue her life in that, and ultimately choose piracy and see that as a much better option than what her mother had to go through. Right. Just that, that kind of idea of like autonomy, really, and independence and being able to essentially support yourself and not necessarily being reliant, reliant on the men in your life to mm-hmm. be able to eat and have a house over your head and clothes on your body, et cetera. So. And the threats of, you know, to your health of just generally being a woman True. and have, being Dying a baby childbirth. factory. Yes. Yeah, so. And then the third one that we were going to touch on is Ching Shi, who was born somewhere around 1775. And interestingly, would retire from piracy in 1810, but wouldn't die until 1844. So she would live out a nice long retirement. But her origin, whereas we have um, Grace O'Malley coming from a kind of high upstanding family, we have Anne Bonny coming from also kind of a higher upstanding beginning as a childhood goes. Ching Shi, we know her early life is in the sex trade. Yeah, she began, she spent a portion of her life as a sex worker, essentially on a floating barge called a flower barge. Um, essentially, like foreigners at that time period were not necessarily allowed to access mainland China. So to sort of um, get some company, they had to find creative ways of doing it. One of these ways are essentially these floating brothels. And that's where Chung Shi meets her future husband, Chung Yi, who is a pirate and essentially takes his wife with him on the pirating lifestyle and mm-hmm. she learns it and excels at it to the point where after he dies, she takes over his crew, essentially. It's kind of like pirate's life meets pretty woman. A little bit, yeah. Yeah, he came in and she got to join his lifestyle and then, so he passes away, she yes. takes it over. She takes it over. She's, um, because it's really, it's a pirate empire really at this point. Like they have thousands of pirates essentially under their command. So mm-hmm. they really need someone who's essentially good at commanding people to essentially keep this and huge 
armada of pirates in check. I mean, they out... There were more people in this pirate armada essentially than were in the Chinese Navy at the time. Yeah, and on top of that, they needed someone that already had a relationship with those men. So her motivating factor differs a little bit in that she had that political desire to continue to support her country in a way, but also do loyalty to her husband, I imagine. Right. And like exactly, and this is you know this is the family essentially that she had married into essentially. So mm-hmm. she was going to do right by her family to what she had to do. And you know she was known as like a very intelligent pirate, a very you know strategically very crafty. Mm-hmm. Um, also, just in terms of keeping law and order about her, she had very strict rules, especially when it came to how you treat women. Rape was punished by death, like no excuses, like sometimes horrific death. So she was very much feared, respected by her men, and also ultimately by kind of the world at large. I mean, the Chinese government actually had to enlist help from outside navies, including the English Navy at one point, to try to even get her into a position where they basically had to force her to negotiate. They essentially like trapped her in a river, essentially sent fire ships at her her, her line of ship to try to basically sight, um, light the entire fleet on fire. They managed to sink one before it got to them, and then the winds changed, and all of a sudden this fire fleet was heading back towards their opposition. These navies, essentially, and unfortunately the navies kind of got the worst of it at that situation. Mm-hmm. She was able to escape, but it was kind of that moment where she sort of realized that this was not sustainable and that she couldn't do this forever. So she it had a time for then, retirement. She had a plan and exit, not just for her, but for like all the people under her that supported her. So mm-hmm. she did something very clever. She actually essentially took a contingency of women and children, went unarmed essentially to the authorities and basically sat down with him and was like, you know, I could destroy you, but I'm not, I'm choosing not to. So here are my terms. And Mm -hmm. if you give me my terms, I will exit this life quietly and not harm you. And they capitulated. Essentially, she got a retirement and a pension essentially out of it. And pardons for essentially all but a few hundred people in her crew essentially went free. And she settled down and lived a very kind of normal life, though. Yeah, obviously about another 30 years well supported but um and she lived into almost her 70s i think she was like 69 or something when she died so Mm -hmm. as we started off by saying like we're looking at three like similar but different motivating factors despite the fact that these three women come from different relatively different time periods different parts of the world and such so different backgrounds different backgrounds um so their motivating factors we're looking at are not too dissimilar from that of men but Mm -hmm. also unique to the two females in that they were looking for that autonomy they were looking for that independence that they would not have gotten and they in were, more traditional you know, several roles several of them were also people with responsibilities so they also had responsibility to the people that followed them so mm-hmm. yeah it was also a motivating factor to not just secure their future but the people that they were essentially fighting for yes definitely so um i leave you with that thought of the fact that one really the thought i want to leave everyone with is that there were actual female pirates out there and they were particularly successful the most successful ones unfortunately we probably don't even know their motivations were probably as diverse as they were as the ladies themselves were i'd love to hear more from anybody that's listening about why you think a woman would choose this lifestyle of piracy and do you think you would live that lifestyle? Given the options, I quick answer would be yes. I think I would probably, given the yeah. limited options for a woman at that time, I'd probably would have gone pirate. I could see it for myself if the circumstances were right. Yeah, mm-hmm. so. I invite you to continue this discussion virtually or in person at the museum with Michelle or myself. We're both very open to talking about this. Once again, we are here from the North Carolina Maritime Museum. Our website is ncmaritimemuseums.com if you want to learn more about us. Until next time, we wish you fair winds and a following sea.